established. 538 AD, the bishop officially recognized as the ruler of all the churches. 1,260 years of time prophecy brings us to 1798 fulfilled. His domain and dominion ended. 1,260 years, it was based on 1,260 days, which is the same as three and a half prophetic years, but it's also the same as 42 months. 42 times 30, that was the biblical month. 42 times 30 is also 1,260. Now in Revelation 12, verse 6, we read, 1,203 score days. That's 1,260 days. In Revelation 12, 14, a time, times, and half a time. See how Revelation picks up the theme of this power and brings it into the heart of Revelation? Here they all are. Daniel 7, 25, time, times, and the dividing of time, referring to this power. Daniel 12, 7, time, times, and a half. Revelation 11, 2, 42 months. Revelation 11, 3, 1260 days. Revelation 12, 6, 1260 days. Revelation 12, 14, time, times, and a half a time. Revelation 13, 5, 40, and two months. All of these referring to the same power. Notice how many there are. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. The Bible is fantastic. What's it telling us? that this power would set itself up as another God. Because seven is the number of God. And it would assume all these characteristics. And I saw one of his heads as it were wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. Rome receives a wound in the form of the little horn power, but it's going to be healed. And all the world wandered after the beast. Revelation 13, 3. So the same power that ruled over the saints for 1,260 days receives a mortal wound, 1798, will rise again, and the whole world will be subject to it. That's what the Bible says. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Does that include the United States? Does that include my country? Yes, it does. Ronald Reagan and the papacy made a holy alliance. That's a fascinating story. We'll have to go into that into a little bit more detail. And so even the mighty United States subjected itself to this power. Here we have a signal picture between Gorbachev and the papacy. This is the mighty Soviet Union at that stage greeting and acknowledging this power. It is a big idea, a new world order, where diverse nations are drawn together in a common cause. Only the United States has both the moral standing and the means to back it up. At the Second Vatican Council, this was a 1962 document, it states, It is our duty, therefore, to strain every muscle in working for the time when all war will be completely outlawed by international consent. This is the Second Vatican Council. This goal undoubtedly requires the establishment of a universal public authority acknowledged as such by all and endowed with the power to safeguard on behalf of all security, regard for justice, and respect for rights. Pope Paul VI wrote in the section entitled Towards Effective World Authority, he wrote, this international collaboration on a worldwide scale requires institutions that will prepare, coordinate, direct it, until finally there is established an order of justice which is universally recognized. Who does not see the necessity of thus establishing progressively a world authority capable of acting effectively in judicial and political sectors? Fascinating stuff. And who was crowned ruler of the whole world? This man himself. Fascinating. John Paul, superstar. Maastricht, the United Europe. What has the world to say about this? Why has the Parliament of Europe got this construction? 
A very interesting construction. We'll give a whole lecture on this interesting situation in Europe and what it means. What did uh, George W. Bush say about this power? March 22, he said, the best way to honor Pope John Paul II, truly one of the great men, is to take his teachings seriously, is to listen to his words, and put his words and teachings into action here in America. This is a challenge we must accept. So who is subject to who here? Who is subject to who? In 1991, the Pope called for a new world order. Well, what was his New Year's speech about this year? He had only one message, and he said it's time to establish the world authority right now. That was his request. He visited the United Nations. He spoke on behalf of all the religions in the entire world. Now please note that that includes Buddhism and Hinduism and Shintoism and Zoroastrianism and Protestantism and Catholicism and the whole shooting match. Is there an agenda? And Gorbachev said, we must help John Paul too because he is right in his request for a new world order, said Gorbachev, when the Pope spoke at the United Nations at its 50th celebration. All right. Do you think it is possible that Rome could be this power? That the Vatican could be this power? But surely the Vatican looks like a noble Christian power trying to set the right values into the world. Doesn't it look like that? Remember the Bible says, man of perdition. Judas looked like one of them, but he betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Here is a power that looks like one of them, but could just betray it with a kiss. We'll have to go into the secrets of the secret societies to find out what this is all about. What did the reformers teach on this power? Many of the great Christians of the Reformation and post-Reformation times shared this view of prophetic truth and identified Antichrist with the Roman papacy. Among the adherents of this interpretation were the Valdenses, the Hussites, Wycliffe, Luther, Calvin, Swingley, Melanchthon, the Baptist theologian John Gill, the Martyrs, Cranmer, Tyndale, Latimer, Ridley, all of them said Rome was the Antichrist. Let's see what Martin Luther said. Luther said, I know that the Pope is Antichrist and that his seat is that of Satan himself. The papacy is a general chase by command of the Roman pontiff for the purpose of running down and destroying souls. That's pretty straight talk. He didn't mince words in those days. What did John Calvin say? He said, we, recall, we call the Roman pontiff Antichrist. Interesting. What did John Wesley say? He said, he is in the emphatic sense the man of sin as he increases all manner of sin above measure. That's what the reformers said. What did John Knox say? He said that the Pope should be recognized as the very Antichrist. Well, the Reformers didn't want anyone to forget. So in Nuremberg, which was the seat of Protestantism, on the town hall they had this sculpture presented over the two doors. And if you look over here, you'll find something interesting. You'll find the prophecy we dealt with tonight. On the one side, you have a lion with eagle's wings, and they have a ruler next to him, and they tell us who he is. It is Nebuchadnezzar. So who did the reformers say the lions with eagle wings stood for? Babylon. If we go to the other side, you have a bear with three ribs in his mouth, and they've put a king next to him, a mighty king, to tell us who they believed it represented. And who was it? This is Cyrus the Great. So hereby they are saying it was the Medes and the Persians. The reformers didn't mince words. They put it in stone. You can go and see it today. If you go to the other side, you'll see the other door. That's what it looks like. Let's go a little bit closer. 
there is a leopard beast with four heads, and who do they put next to it to say who they believed it was? That's Alexander the Great. So they identified it with Greece. And on the other side is a terrible beast with ten horns, and they have a mighty emperor there, and who is he? Is Julius Caesar. So who did they say it was? They said it was Rome. And then over here, they have this strange little structure coming up amongst them. And it has the face of a man, and it has this strange little crown. They made no bones as to who it was. They said it was Rome. Who teaches that today still? Nobody. Nobody teaches it anymore. Do the Christian churches teach it? No, they don't. In fact, they've all joined the ecumenical movement, which says, let's again accept Rome as our spiritual leader. All the Christian denominations are part of the ecumenical movement. And all of them are saying, put the chains back on. Rather sad. Let not anyone deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come unless the first comes of falling away, and the man of sin shall be revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself over all that is called God, all that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, setting himself forth that he is God. Does this make sense now? It certainly does. If it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. The garb of Christianity is so perfect that we do not see the core of occultism behind it. Who really runs the show there? Who is behind it? What power is yielded in Rome? Who is the Black Pope? Who is Peter Hans Kolvenbach at the moment? Who is that? What is his role in the world? Would you like to know? So we see he shall devour the whole earth. That means this web of intrigue must spread across the whole world. And he will continue to the end. He's here right now. But his dominion will be taken away at the end of time. Now, I am not saying that any Roman Catholic who is not aware of any of this which is in the Bible is Antichrist. I'm talking about a system here. This is a system. There are many, many fine Roman Catholics in the Roman Catholic Church who worship God according to the best knowledge and according to the conscience that they have. And God takes the knowledge that they have and judges according to the knowledge that they have. I'm talking about a system that has deceived even its own members and that sets itself up above God. The Bible says the judgment shall sit and they shall take away his rulership to cut off and to destroy until the end and the kingdom and the rulership will belong to who? Will belong to God's people. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels and then he will reward each person according to what he has done. And the greatness of the kingdoms under all the heavens, says Daniel, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all kingdoms shall serve and obey him. God is going to make an end of all things very soon. And to find out what the intrigue behind the intrigues are, I invite you to come to the next lectures. Even if you were upset tonight, it's very important that you come to the next lectures, because this whole plan will be unfolded as we go into the book of Revelation. May the Lord be with you and help you and guide you.
Good evening, everyone. Well, tonight we're going to start a series that is going to be hair-raising. Because the book of Revelation is the story about the final conflict between the forces of good and the forces of evil. It also has the history of the conflict from the birth of Christianity to the end of time. It really is an incredible book. And of course, the ultimate author of this book is none other than Jesus Christ himself. And the revelation of Jesus Christ is the most amazing book in the Bible. It ends the biblical story. In the beginning we have the book of Genesis. In Genesis we have the lost tree of life. Mankind fell into sin and lost access to the tree of life. The consequences were death, Genesis chapter 2 verse 17. And from that moment on, man had to earn his bread by the sweat of his brow. Genesis chapter 3 verse 19. Man lost his dominion because he was created to have dominion. And he became naked. He lost the robe of righteousness which covered him. And then he was driven from God because sin and a holy God are incompatible. That's the story of Genesis. It's the sad story of the creation of man and the fall of man. The greatest gift to mankind that God could have given is the gift of freedom of choice. Without freedom of choice we are robots. And so God created man in the image of God with the capacity to choose. And love demands this gift of freedom of choice. I always use an example. What good is it if your wife or your husband loves you because he's pre-programmed to do so? That might be fun for a week, a year, maybe even five years, but then eventually you'll get kind of sick of it, right? If they're programmed to love you and every morning they get up and they say, I love you, because they're programmed to do so. But what happens if they have freedom of choice and in spite of your faults, in spite of all the things that you do that are obviously uh, an irritation to everyone around you, what if they still say, I love you because they choose to. Doesn't that make it meaningful? Without freedom of choice, life is meaningless. So God created man in his image with the capacity to choose. That's special. And so man chose, and unfortunately he chose the wrong way. Revelation is the book of grace. In Revelation chapter 2 verse 7 we read about the restoration of the tree of life. We read about victory over death in Revelation chapter 2 verse 11. We read about hidden manna, this is uh, the bread that came from heaven that was placed in the Ark of the Covenant and represented this heavenly bread which would take away your hunger forever and that was replaced and we read about it in Revelation chapter 2 verse 17. Dominion would be restored, Revelation 2 verse 26. Those that accepted this wonderful gift from God would be clothed in white, so the lost robe of righteousness would be restored, Revelation 3 verse 5. And no more separation from God, Revelation 3 verse 12. So the book of Revelation is a book of restoration, but it also has information in it which is scary, to put it bluntly, scary. The structure of the book, there are seven churches, seven letters, seven stars, seven candlesticks, seven spirits, seven lamps, seven seals, seven trumpets, seven horns, seven eyes, seven thunders, seven heads, seven crowns, seven angels, seven vials, and seven mountains. So the number seven is obviously important. The number seven is the the number of the divine, it's the number of perfection, it is the message of God built in. But there is a counterfeit as well, and we will be dealing with that as we go along. 
And obviously, if we look at all these components, then there is a symbolic meaning in all of these as well. So the book of Revelation uses symbolic language. And where does it get the symbolic language from? It draws it from the Old Testament. So without the Old Testament, we would not be able to understand the book of Revelation. Many of the symbols in the book of Revelation come, for example, from Zechariah, from Ezekiel, from all the prophets of the Old Testament, particularly also Daniel. And many of the symbols that we find in the book of Revelation, you will find in the book of Daniel. You will find the terrible beasts in the book of Revelation. And the description of the beasts, like lions, like leopards, like bears, and terrible beasts with ten horns, you will find those in the book of Daniel. And you will find the number seven in the book of Daniel. If you go through Daniel chapter 7, for example, you will have beasts there, and if you count up the heads of the beasts that are mentioned in Daniel chapter 7, you'll find seven heads. And so you will find seven heads in the book of Revelation. So the picture is drawn from there, and it is the key to the book of Revelation. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to go through the book of Daniel in order to unlock some of these things, so we're just going to say it straight up. But there are other videos which have already been made which have all the details as to how these symbolic figures in the book of Daniel can be applied to the book of Revelation. So we'll be dealing with the churches, the letters, the stars, the candlesticks. Tonight we'll be dealing with the seven churches, for example, and many of these components will start to become clear. Then there's something else about the book of Revelation that's very fascinating. There's a sanctuary language in the book of Revelation. Now, you know, in the Old Testament, the Hebrews had to build a sanctuary for God, and it was very precisely laid out how the sanctuary had to look, what the components were. There was a, a wall around it, an outer covering of linen representing righteousness. There was one door into the sanctuary. There was an altar in an outer court where the offerings were made. There was a laver where they washed themselves. Then there was a compartment which was divided into two, the first being called the holy, then the most holy, and the high priest officiated in the sanctuary. And this sanctuary language tells us about the ministry of the high priest, applied to the ministry of the great high priest who would take the place of all those that had been typified in the Old Testament. So the sanctuary language is very important because it tells us where and at what stage of the ministry this story is unfolding. So, for example, when you go Revelation chapters 1 to 3, you have the story of the seven churches, Jesus, the light of the world. There was only one entryway into the sanctuary, and it was called the gate. And Jesus says, I am the door. He who enters in by me shall have eternal life. There is only one door, according to the Bible, whereby we may be saved. And that is through Christ Jesus. That's what the Bible says. Today, that is not a popular teaching. And it's going to get less and less popular as we go along. And we're going to look at some of these, these teachings. So, for example, the gate, the doorway, was very, very important in the Old Testament times. It was the place where judgment took place. The elders sat in the gate. The gate was the doorway behind the walls whereby you could enter into safety. There's a lot of symbolism in the gate. And Jesus Christ says, I am the door. I am the gate. Now, the old word that they used for gate was bab. And there's a story in the Bible about Babel. Bab El, gate to God. So, story of Babel tells us of another gate to God, another entryway to God. The Bab El, Babel, gate 
to God. And this is a story of your own merit bringing you to God. That is the counterfeit that we have in the Bible to the biblical story of save by the blood of the Lamb. The only way to salvation is through the merit, not of our works, but through the merit of Jesus Christ. Those are the two parameters that have been in opposition to each other since the dawn of man, since the fall of man, let's put it that way. So here, when we're dealing with lights, the lights were in the first chamber, so that means ministry in the holy. Uh, when we come to Revelation chapter 3 to 8, we're dealing with the seals, and that is bread of the presence, so we're still in that first chamber of the sanctuary, in the holy place. And then come the trumpets, Revelation 8 to 11, and there you can see a golden altar, where you have incense rising from the golden altar. So we're still in the holy place. These are, are chambers or events taking place in a period where the high, high priest representatively is still serving in that particular chamber. As soon as you get to Revelation chapter 12 to 14, there's another picture. There the prophet sees the Ark of God. Now the Ark of God was not in the first chamber of the, of the sanctuary, it was in the second chamber, which was called the Most Holy, the Hagia Hagion, in the Most Holy. So we've moved to another portion of the ministry of the high priest. And he only entered into the place where the Ark stood once a year. And that was on the Day of Atonement. Now these are, are heavy subjects and we haven't got time to deal with all of them. Again, there's a video available on this particular topic of what all these things meant. And if you study it in this way, you get a picture of where you are in the stream of time. There are seven blessings in the book of Revelation. Blessed is he that readeth, and they that hear the words of this prophecy, and keep those things which are written therein, for the time is at hand. Revelation 1 verse 3. So obviously, God wants us to read it, to hear it, and to take it to heart, because how can you keep something that you don't understand, right? So when you're looking at this blessing, isn't it pretty certain that God wants us to understand what the book of Revelation is about? Absolutely. So there's a blessing in it. So how is it possible that some say that it is a sealed book not to be understood? Well, then you forego this blessing. Some actually say it is a book that shouldn't be read because it's for the damned. Well, if it is for the damned, then how can there be a blessing if you read it and take it to heart. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Revelation 14, 13. Here's also an allusion to the works issue. Works is not a means to salvation. It's a consequence of salvation. But there is a blessing to those that die in Christ. Those who have accepted the Lamb as their means to salvation, rather than above El, another port to God. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watches and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. So we have to cling to the righteousness of Christ. We have no righteousness. Christ is our righteousness, and uh, if we give up that idea, and if we give up the hope of His coming to save those that are His, well, then the chances are that we will walk naked. Revelation 19, 9, and He says unto me, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And He says unto me, These are true sayings of God. Well, obviously there's a blessing in it if you are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. That means that you form part of the bride. Blessed and holy is he that has part in the first resurrection. See, there are two resurrections mentioned in the Bible. The first resurrection 
is the resurrection of those who die in Christ and they take part in this wedding feast. And then there is a second resurrection and they take part in another feast which is called the Supper of the Birds. And I don't think we want to take part in that one. So those that take part in the, have a part in the first resurrection, they are the ones that shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Here you have the millennial period. The seven blessings. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keeps the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Revelation 22 verse 7. I believe this means more than just the book of Revelation. The whole Bible. The Bible is the standard for the setting of character. It is the story of salvation. And blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. So obedience to God is a very important factor as well. Revelation 22 verse 14. Now obviously there's going to be a, a counter argument to all of those factors. Now the book of Revelation is written in a particular structure. We call such a structure a chiasm. It's a literary structure which is supposed to set the events in a particular way in time. So for example, if we take the book of Revelation as a whole, it is written in a, in a sort of a pyramid shape. And the first parts are what we call the historic arm, the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and they lead up to the great controversy climax between Christ and Satan, and the followers of Satan and the followers of Christ. And the second arm, reading from the back to the middle, would be the New Jerusalem, the millennium, and the fall of Babylon. So this structure tells us where we are in the stream of time. And if you understand the structure of the book of Revelation, then it's easier to get round. Because some people like to throw things all over the place. For example, there are many who take the trumpets and throw them into the future. In other words, into the eschatology. So they'll take the trumpets and apply them to events still to come in the, in the future when God restores all things. But then of course you destroy the chiasm. You cannot destroy the chiasm. You can also see where each one of these fits in by looking at the sanctuary language. So for example, when you're looking at the churches, the seals and the trumpets, the language that is used there still applies to the first chamber. I'll be dealing with that as we go along. It doesn't matter if we don't understand it all at this stage. So it tells us historically where we are in the stream of time so that we don't jump ahead of ourselves. We have to stick to the rules. And this is a marvelous way of getting around in the book of Revelation. There's a problem though, because once you've read through the first half of the book and you come to the middle, which is basically Revelation chapter 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, all the way up to 17. That's the sort of final block of the final events of the battle between good and evil. Once you start reading past that, you are actually reading events in reverse because the chiasm is structures like this. And so it gets very confusing you have things in the wrong sequence and it doesn't make any sense and the book of Revelation gets so complicated that you cannot put them into any particular order. Whereas if you know that it is a chiasm, then you can read the words as they follow in English, but the events you put in reverse and then the whole thing falls into place and it makes beautiful sense. And the literary style has, has a reason. It prevents us from becoming disjointed and jumping all over the place. Now let's just have a look how, some, how you pick it up so that it's not just some conjecture that someone makes. So for example, if you take the seven churches, you'll see that in chapter 2 verse 1 it says, He that holdeth the seven stars walketh in the midst of the seven candlesticks, the golden candlesticks. 
And when you look at the end of the book of Revelation, the New Jerusalem, you'll find in chapter 21, verse 23, the Lamb is the light thereof. So there you have a light, and you have the Lamb being the light thereof. Chapter 2, verse 7, To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life. Chapter 22, verse 2, we have the mention of the tree of life. So there you have the chiastic link. There's an open door in Revelation 3, verse 8. In Revelation 21, verse 25, towards the end, you have gates that never close. Christ in his Father's throne, on his Father's throne, Revelation 3, 21, 22, 1 and 3, the throne of God and of the Lamb. The New Jerusalem is mentioned in chapter 3, verse 12, and the New Jerusalem comes down in chapter 21, verse 10. In chapter 3, 11, I am coming soon. Chapter 22, verse 7, I am coming soon. You see how you pick up the chiasm? How they stick together? So you know, all right, this is how we're working, and this is how we move along. Now, what's also interesting is that anything that falls into the first part of the chiasm must be before the close of probation. Because the high priest is ministering. And that means salvation is open to all. When you come to the eschatology, probation is closed. Because the gates never close anymore. They are constantly open. The throne of God has become the throne of God and of the Lamb. That means Christ reigns in his kingdom. So you can pick up where you are in the stream of time. So you cannot make a mistake by putting things in the wrong place. So it helps us to stay within the framework. When you come to the seven seals and you pick up the, uh, the story there again, the seven seals are about Christ and his afflicted people and uh, you have the resurrected people enthroned. Here they are afflicted, there they are enthroned. So obviously the seven seals falls into which portion? Probation closed or open? Probation must still be open because they are still being inflicted, they are here on earth. Whereas in the second part, they are enthroned. Their suffering is over, they have been restored. So here you have heaven opened, and chapter 19, 11, heaven opened. Chapter 6, the rider on a white horse. Chapter 19, a rider on a white horse. Chapter 6, verse 9, the souls of the martyrs ask for judgment. And in chapter 20, the souls of the martyrs are resurrected and enthroned as judges. In chapter 6 and 7, you hear about white robes. In chapter 19, they are given white robes. In chapter 6, 15 and 16, he hears about, you hear about kings, generals, etc. They ask to be killed, and here they are killed. Again, so you find the structure coming together. Then the book of Revelation contrasts Christ and his people with Satan and his followers. So you have a trinity of God. You have the Father, you have the Son, and you have the Holy Spirit. And if you come to... Satan's followers, you have a false trinity. You have the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. Now the dragon, he represents God the Father. The beast, you will see in the book of Revelation, he is the one that takes the place of Jesus Christ. He is the one that sets up a kingdom, but it is an earthly kingdom. He's the one where everybody bows down to him. Every knee shall bow. The beast is the one that has a counterfeit death and a counterfeit resurrection. He is the false Christ, the Antichristos, the Antichrist, in the place of Jesus Christ. Because in 75% of cases, the word Antichrist means in the place of. And we have to know what we're dealing with. And the false prophet is then obviously the one who plays the role of the false Holy Spirit. And these three powers are going to deceive the whole world into following a wrong set of rules and following a wrong savior. This is a dangerous story. And it is so perfectly done and so deceptive that if we do not study it in detail, we will not even know. Do you think that the world today 
might be largely deceived, yes or no? Absolutely, that's what the book of Revelation talks about. What is it that Jesus said when the disciples approached him and asked him, what is the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? What is the first thing that Jesus said? He said, be careful lest anyone deceive you. Deception is the name of the game. In the lectures that are coming now, we will be dealing with deception like you have probably never heard it before. And we're going to deal with some things which are hair-raising, hair-raising. So don't miss the lectures. We're going to talk about things that are done in secret. Who does things in secret? Yes. Jesus says, I have done nothing in secret. But there are many things that are done in secret. And this world, make no mistake, is being run by secret societies. So we're going to have a look at secret societies because the book of Revelation is about what happens in secret. All power unto the sun, power unto the beast. See the contrast? Hebrews, Revelation 6, 2. All power unto the sun and the counterfeit system, all power unto the beast. The keys of death and Hades and the keys to the bottomless pit. Revelation 9, 1 verses 1, 18 in uh, Revelation. So here you have the contrast between Christ and his followers and Satan and his followers. And we will have to be very meticulous to take these apart. Who is like unto the Lord? Isaiah 40, 18. Who is like unto the beast? Revelation 13 verse 4. So the beast power... He's scary. We have to watch him. A lamb as it had been slain, Revelation 13, 8. One of the heads as it were wounded to death. Some translations say seemed to have a mortal wound. He which is and which was and which is to come, Revelation 1, verse 4. The beast which was and is not and is about to come, Revelation 17, verse 8. Can you see the contrast? So we're going to deal in terms of a battle. And the one that is going to be the visible component of the battle is going to be the beast. But he is hidden. His name is Secret. And so we have to look behind the scenes to find him. Because that which you see is not that which is. That which you see is what you are supposed to see, but that which you do not see is what you are not supposed to see and you're not supposed to know about it and that is very important that we find out what happens behind the scenes then we read in revelation 6:16 6, about the wrath of the lamb in revelation 12:12 12, 12, we read about the wrath of the devil in revelation 7 2 and 3 god's seal is in the forehead of those that follow him but in revelation 13 the beast's mark is in the forehead or in the hand isn't that right? So we have the contrast. We have the name of God in Revelation 14.1 and we have the name of the beast in Revelation 13.17. We have the tribes of Israel in Revelation 1.4. We have the tribes of the earth, Revelation 1.7. We have the armies of heaven, Revelation 19.14. We have the armies of earth, Revelation 19.19. We have war against Satan and his people and we have war against Christ and his followers, Revelation 12, 17, etc. So there's a battle. This is a war. This is a story about a war. We have a supper of the lamb. We have a supper of the birds. We have the lamb's bride. We have the harlot of Babylon. We have the apostles of the lamb. We have the false apostles. We have the Jerusalem of God. And we have Babylon, Satan's church. And we have the ruler of heaven, earth, and sea, and we have the beast out of the sea, the beast out of the earth, and the dragon. So we have all these contrasts in the book of Revelation. If we read the book of Jeremiah, then we have a typological story of what this great battle is all about. You see, there was a then time story where there was a real war between Babylon and the people of God. And the prophet Jeremiah is the one who warned against the coming of Babylon. The coming of Babylon. Did the people like the message of Jeremiah? 
Nope, they didn't like it one little bit. They lowered him into the cistern, they beat him up, they put him in stocks, they did all kinds of terrible things to poor Jeremiah. They didn't like the message. Nothing's changed, by the way. Jeremiah 2 verse 11, has the nation changed their gods, which are yet not gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. This is a battle about God's people. Be astonished, O you heavens, at this, and be horribly afraid. Be ye very desolate, says the Lord, for my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and have hewed them out cisterns, broken cisterns that cannot hold water. There's a story of what happened in literal Jerusalem versus Babylon. Do you think the same could happen in our time? Do you think it's possible? Do you think the Revelation might be trying to tell us something? Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 26 says, The thief is ashamed when he is found, so is the house of Israel ashamed. And they, their kings, their princes, and their priests, and their prophets, saying to a stock, Thou art my father, and to a stone. Thou hast brought me forth, for they have turned their back unto me, and not their faces. But in the time of their trouble they will say, Arise and save us. So they're facing east. They're worshipping a different deity. But where are thy gods that thou hast made thee? Let them arise if they can save thee in the time of thy trouble. For according to the number of thy cities are thy gods, O Judah. So did they have many idols, yes or no? Yeah, do you think there will be many idols in the last days? I think so. Deuteronomy 4.28 And there you shall serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see, nor hear, nor eat, nor smell. Daniel 5.23 But hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven, and have brought the vessels of the house before thee, and thou and thy lords, thy wives, and thy concubines have drunk wine in them, and thou hast praised the gods of silver and gold, of brass and iron and wood and stone, which see not, nor hear, nor know, and the God in whose hands thy breath is, and whose are all thy ways, hast thou not glorified. Same thing It's going to happen in our time. So they served idols today. Today we also have idols. No difference. Let's just go to ancient times, and I'll run you briefly through what the structures looked like. This is an ancient place called Euripus, and uh, it's in Syria. And here are the ruins of an ancient city. Now we could go there with this transport, but uh, it seemed somewhat flimsy, so we opted for this luxury vehicle over here. And we drove many, many hundreds of kilometers with this old Mercedes to this particular place. And uh, that's what it looked like, totally trashed. You cannot believe that a car like that can still drive. And uh, interesting statement on the front there, strong car, faster. Well, this uh, Arab man took us to this ancient city. And here you can find the main gates and the towers and the houses and the temples of Adonis and uh, temples of Zeus and all the ancient citadels. This was a town after the formation of Christianity. And in this town you had a Christian church. It's very interesting. And if you look at the foundations, that's what it was, just one little room. And this is obviously where the Christians met. And in the same town, you had other temples. So people visited the temple of Adonis, for example. He was the son. He was the son of God, if you like. Here was a counterfeit son of God. And what did that look like? Well, you can just see the foundations. So obviously here was the building, and you entered in over here, and there was a central hall with two side halls on the side, and here stood pillars separating this hall from the side halls. And there were altars in the side halls, and there was a main altar in the middle. Now who builds like that today? Every single cathedral on the face of the earth has that structure. Every single cathedral. Isn't that interesting? Now, we could go into great detail there. 
but we will not. The the yes, they're all built like that, exactly. Uh, here is the river Euphrates, so we are dealing with uh, a nice typology of Babylon, if you like. Here were steps leading up to the temple of Zeus, the father of the gods. And if you go to Syria, then the most famous one, of course, was the great goddess of the fountains. And uh, this is the city where they're digging this up, Mari. And uh, they're finding some very interesting things down there. They built with clay, for example, clay bricks. The Bible tells us that Babylon was constructed with clay bricks. Here you have the Temple of Bacchus. This is in Lebanon. And fascinating what you find there. This is a pillar, a huge pillar found at Baalbek. This was the largest pillar in the world until they found the other one. This one was discovered in 93. And you can see the size of the, the man next to it over there. And uh, that's me. I'm just, you know, picking it up there. No, no sweat. No, no. <laughs> it's huge. You cannot imagine the size of these structures. These are actually not pillars. Here's one that was rejected. There's a man standing over there as a scale. And uh, they transported these and built them into their temples. There's one of them lying over there. The foundation stones down here are these huge blocks of stone. How they transported them, nobody knows. This is the Bacchus Temple. And uh, it used to be the Temple of Baal. That's why the town is still called Baal Bek. I'm giving you some history of the apostasy in the past so that we can compare it with the present. Here at Baalbek, you have this temple of Bacchus. Here is the temple of Jupiter with its six pillars still standing. Very, very beautiful. And uh, the sun striking the pillars. It was a system of sun worship. Of course, Bacchus, the god of drunkenness and revelry. Maybe this pillar had a, had a little bit too much to drink. I don't know. And uh, if you go in to the altar of Jupiter, for example, you found this structure. This is exactly what the god Quetzalcoatl looks like in South America. So you know where the South American Ameri uh, religion came from. Then you had Venus with uh, winged lions on the side. The Bible talks about the lion with eagle wings as a symbol of Babylon. And you had this structure over here, the circle with the cross in it, was a symbol of Baal. You'll find it in many, many churches today. If you go to the Jupiter Temple further, you will find some interesting structures, lions again, certain reliefs on the uh, pillars. You had these swastikas all over. They were a symbol of sun worship. There they are, somewhat enlarged. You'll find the same swastika under the foot of Buddha. Buddhism uses exactly the same symbol that was used in the Temple of Baal. Uh, you'll find it on uh, Roman reliefs in ancient times. There you will find it even in the time of the Hittites, the swastika. You'll find the symbol of the circle with the dot in it used in the past. Uh, you will find altars and uh, sacrificial pillars, three arches with three deities in it. Normally they would have the father, the mother, and the child in them. Here you have another interesting symbol that is used today. Uh, owls and uh, falcons, very popular, and interesting structures like this one, for example. What would you say that structure was? It looks like the Star of David, doesn't it? Now, well, the Star of David has nothing to do with David, and I will, you will not find the Star of David in the Bible, this is a star that was used even in the times of the Hittites. It's a symbol of Baal. You'll find that Islam uses it. There's the name Allah in the hexagram. And here you'll find Om in it. Hinduism uses it. It was used in Baal worship. The half moon with a star in it, or the sickle moon, as is used in Islam, there you'll find it amongst the Hittites. This symbol over here, well, there you find it being used in NATO, by NATO today. Angels, pigs, 
a woman with a mini dress on, with a golden cup in her hand. These are symbols that tell us that the symbolism in the temples of Baal was identical to the symbolism used in the book of Revelation and in the world today. And we are going to compare in this time that we're going to spend together what happened then and what is happening today. A great apostasy towards God existed in the past. A great apostasy exists today. Christ is being dethroned today as he was dethroned in the past. It is time to put him back into the center and give him the rightful place which is rightfully his. In our previous session we looked at some of the symbols that you found in the temples of Baal and the temples of Bel. And a very interesting symbol was this one over here that you find in Baalbek in the temple of Baal. It's a woman with a cup in her hand. Now the book of Revelation speaks about a woman that rides the beast that has a golden cup in her hand. Fascinating to find them in the various places. If you go to these temples you will find that they were temples of death. You will always find tombs in them and bones. Did you know that there is not a cathedral in the world where you will not walk on the corpses of men? No cathedral may be built without dead bodies. In fact every cathedral is a cemetery. And you cannot say a mass in a cathedral or in a church if there is not a relic of a dead individual in that particular building. So if you walk into the great cathedrals you are walking on the bodies of men. If you went to the temples of Baal you will find little angels. Where in the Bible do you read about little angels? Nowhere. Nowhere. Angels are described in the Bible as masculine and of great power and magnificent beings. In the temple of Baal they were reduced to tiny little cupid-like angels, fat little angels. There they are in the Baal temple. Where do you find them today? You'll find them in all the churches. Now let's have a look up here. Interesting symbolism up against the ceiling. Let's draw it a little bit closer. You'll find the eagle standing on a key. There are many churches that use this symbolism today. There you have the great god Osiris with wings and the pine cones and you'll find the gods and the goddesses of licentiousness if you like within the hexagrams and the hexagons and you'll find the hexagrams and the hexagons on the ceilings of the temples of Baal like you can see them over there if you look up. This is the city of palms, Palmyra and it has the longest column are still in existence today. Even today there are palm trees over there and this is the longest Roman colonnade still existing and if you look at it it is magnificent and if you look into the back there you'll see the temple of Bell. Now the word Bell today is used by industry exclusively uh, and you'll find many many allusions to Bell in the world today. There is the temple of Bel. This is the best preserved temple of Bel in the world. Basically another form of Baal. And if that's the courtyard on the outside, that was the place where they did their offering. They also had a holy place and a most holy place. It was structured on the same plan basically as that of Israel. But of course Satan is an angel fallen from heaven and he had the plan as well. So his is a counterfeit of the heavenly story. If you look up against the ceiling you have sun symbols and you have palm trees and you have these deities represented as pine cones and pomegranates and pineapples and uh, you'll find halos around them, around the sun deities. Again you will find feathers and, and uh, eagles and interesting things up against the walls which we don't even have to talk about. This is a very interesting one. This is the flame of Lucifer. 
This is the flame of Baal. What's it look like? It looks exactly like an Olympic torch. Exactly like an Olympic torch. In fact, they just lit one the other day, if you watch television, and they said a prayer to whom? Apollo, the sun god. It's not dead today, it's just disguised. Of course, you have the grapes for Bacchus, you have the fleur de lis and the, the triangles and the sphinxes with their breasts, female representations. There is one. And uh, angels with wings amongst the pine cones. And here is the upside down triangle with eagles in it. This symbolism is used today in all the mighty political entities of the world. So we have a lot of things to look at in the book of Revelation. The eagle in its various forms is the, is the symbol of many, many nations. So the book of Revelation is going to tell us about this great conflict between good and evil. This great conflict between idolatry and the worship of the true God. And we're going to look at things which will stun you. We're going to look at the intricacies of the workings behind the scenes. How the world today is really moving towards the enthronement of another power. And the book of Revelation warns us about these things. So now let's go through the first chapter, verse by verse. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants the things which must shortly come to pass. Wonderful. So he's going to tell us ahead of time what's going to happen. Now if someone has the power to tell you accurately ahead of time what's going to happen, isn't that somebody that you could trust? I would say so. In fact, prophecy changed me from being an atheist to being a believer. And experience taught me to follow Christ. He's not just on paper. He's real. He's believable. He's trustworthy. His promises are yea and amen. He says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And I have found him to be trustworthy. And he sent, shortly come to pass, and he sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. So John is now receiving this revelation. Who bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. So even though we are going to talk about terrible, terrible things in the lectures to come, and I'm telling you again, it'll be like you have never heard it before. And people might say to me, why are you concentrating on what the evil side is doing? Why not just talk about Jesus? I wish I could do that. I wish I could talk just about Jesus. But there's a problem. How would you feel if you had a child that you really, really love. Let's talk about love. Let's say you had a child and you really, really loved that child. But you know that that child is busy with wrong things. And that that child is going to be destroyed if it carries on along that path. How would you feel? What would you do? It's no point saying to the child, Mommy loves you. Because the child is infatuated with whatever it's doing. Surely if your child is on drugs, it's very important to show the child that you love the child. But isn't it also important to warn the child, yes or no? Yes. So what do we do when we do this? We educate the child on what? On the dangers of drugs, right? And we tell the child, this is what's going to happen, this, that, that and the other. Do they listen? No, something else has to happen in the heart. But these things are important for the child to make a decision in the end. Or what if you find your child joining some, I don't know, some vicious group that eventually will lead to the child's destruction? 
Wouldn't you like to tell the child that here and here and here and here is the deception of what this particular organization or group is doing, yes or no? Wouldn't you want to save that child out of all those problems? So yes, unfortunately it is so that there are many deceptions in many things that lead on the broad path to destruction. And we're going to have to reveal them. And that is painful. And it's going to be talking about the negative. But why do we do it? Because we want people to choose the positive. And if we can take all the parameters in the world and we can say, this one is deceptive because of this, that one because of this, this one because of that, eventually only one remains. And that's Jesus Christ. So basically what we are doing is we are going to follow a process of exclusion. We're going to look at the various components of Babylon and then maybe we'll discover that all of us have been trapped. All of us have been lied to. Every single one of us as we sit here today has been deceived. It's a terrible thought. But in the end it crystallizes out that there's only one that can be trusted and that is Jesus Christ. And he alone can save you. I am the door. I am the way. I am the word. He who believes in me shall never perish. That's what he said. Either it's the truth or it's a lie. If the world wants to come together and join one big happy family and we all have to tolerate every single thing that is being taught in the world, is that truth or is it truth mingled with error? You tell me. So we have to find out whether all paths lead to God or whether only one path leads to God. And we have to decide on the basis of that. So, bear record of the word of God and of the testimony of Jesus Christ and of all things that he saw. The word of God and the prophecies of the Bible, we'll have to understand them. Blessed is he that readeth and that hear the words of the prophecy and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Revelation 1 verse 3, verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia. We're going to deal with them in the next lecture in detail. Grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come. And from the seven spirits which are before his throne. Now, obviously the Bible teaches that there is one God Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So the number seven here is the number of perfection. Also, we'll see that there are seven time periods. He's going to discuss the events over time periods divided into seven. So the seven spirits before God is one spirit of God, perfect number seven, in all time throughout history. One spirit. So we mustn't get confused and have more spirits than there are. Because the Bible has to be in harmony with itself. And then the greatest part about Revelation chapter 1 is it tells us who and what the author is. And it's written in an amazing fashion. It's written in a way which is called an epanados. Now an epanados is like a chiasm, except that instead of describing events, it quotes in a certain sequence. So for example, this Epinados consists of a series of quotes which want to highlight a particular point. Isaiah chapter 55 verse 4, you read about a witness. And it's a quote from, uh, it's Revelation 1 verse 5 and it's a quote from Isaiah. And if you go to the end of it, there's another quote in Revelation 1 verse 16 which is also from Isaiah. Then there is another point, the second point mentioned, Revelation 1-7 talks about the coming with the clouds. It's a quote from Daniel chapter 7-13. And then you have one at the end here, Revelation 1-13, where it talks about the priest, and it's a quote from Daniel 7-9. And so the first and the last is from Isaiah, 
The second and the second last is from Daniel. The third and the third last is from Zechariah. And then there are two in the middle. Boom, boom. That lifts out the central theme. That's an epinodos. And the central theme is, I am the Alpha and the Omega. If you take one away, you don't have an epinodos. There must be two in the middle. So some Bibles say, but the Bible repeats itself. Why say this twice? <whistles> take out the one. Well, you destroy the structure. You cannot take one word out of the Bible, or you're in trouble. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Well, we better make sure we read all of it. All of it. Whole lecture coming on that topic. Fascinating stuff. Anyway, the book of Revelation chapter 1 proves that Jesus Christ is the great I Am. He is God. Now that's a problem today. That's a problem. Because if Jesus is God, and if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and if Jesus is the only way whereby you can be saved, well then you have a problem. If you want to be in the same pot with all the other religions of the world. Because Jesus has to become a little bit less in order to fit into the same level as all the others. Now we have a problem. Obviously, the world cannot afford one group to say that it has a superior religion over any other group. Would you agree with me in the world that we're living today? You cannot have that. So Jesus has to be made a little bit less so that the others can be a little bit more. How do you achieve that? You create the pain of exclusiveness. In other words, you make it so painful to be exclusive that you'd rather choose to be less exclusive. Does that make sense? Think about that. Either he is what he says he is, or he is not what he says he is. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. Does this tell us what Jesus is all about, yes or no? Is this exclusive and special, or is this something on a par with everyone else? I'm not knocking any other religion, I'm just asking. Is Jesus on a par with, let's say, Buddha? In this particular text, yes or no? Is he on a par with Zoroaster? Is he on a par with Shiva? Yes or no? Or Cyrus? Yes or no? No? Because this one's different. He loved us. He washed us. He's the king of kings. He's the prince of all of them. And he's the only one who can save because he's the only one who is what? God. Do you know what the difference is between Christianity and all the other religions of the world? The difference is that Christ's tomb is empty. Christianity is the only religion on the face of the earth that gives a reason for the state of the planet, the mess we're in. And it's the only religion on the face of the earth that has a solution to the problem. All the other religions find their solution in their own works and if they don't succeed now, try, try, and try again through various reincarnations until you finally get it right. Is it getting better or is it getting worse? And they're obviously not doing too well at it, right? So Christianity gives a reason and it gives a solution. And it tells us why and it tells us how. There's no other religion on the face of the earth that does this. And Christianity has the word of God which is the infallible will of God, which has been attacked at every single level, from the scientific level right through to the historic level, to the level of the salvation. And you know what? The Bible has stood the test of time. It's the only book on the face of the earth that has been vindicated scientifically, archaeologically, historically, and in terms of its salvation premise. It picks people up from where they are 
and changes them into something else. There is no other book like it. And even if the whole world teaches something else, as they are at the moment, believe me they do, then pick up those videos about creation and evolution and have a look at them. Make up your mind on the base of the scientific facts. I was a professor at the university for more than 30 years and I was professor of zoology and I was probably the only one in secular university that didn't believe in evolution. That took some doing. And he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Behold, he cometh with the clouds and every eye shall see him and they also which pierced him and all kindred of the earth shall wail because of him, even so, amen. In other words, rather than having this sumptuous joy at the coming of Christ, most of them will what? Wail. Here's a different story to what is being taught even in the world of Christianity, where everybody is waiting for the restoration of the kingdom and a second chance. Some believe, no, we don't even have to wait for every eye to see them because we'll be raptured away. Does the Bible teach that? I am the Alpha and the Omega. There's the center of the Eponados. The beginning and the ending, says the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. That's pretty straight talk. Jesus Christ in the book of Revelation is identified not just as King of Kings, the Savior of the world, but he is identified as God. If we make Jesus Christ any less than he is, then I'm afraid we have no Savior. Because then that Savior would be in the same boat that we are in. So he's God. I, John, who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was in the isle of called Patmos for the word of God. So if you preach the word, you're in trouble. And for the testimony of Jesus Christ, which is the prophetic word over all time. So if you preach prophecy, you're going to get into trouble. So are you all prepared for what's coming? We're going to look at some of these things, and it's scary. We're going to look at very interesting things. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Revelation 1, 8 to 10. So on what day was he in the Spirit? I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. Revelation 1, 10. If thy turn thy foot away from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord honorable, Isaiah 58, 13, it's the only one that is called the holy day of the Lord. So obviously, he was in spirit on the Sabbath day. But Mark also talks about the fact that the Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. So obviously, he was in vision on this day, on the Sabbath day, and God showed him what was going to happen in the world saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Now I'm not going to deal with the details, because I'm going to deal with them in the next lecture. Unto Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea. Each name has a particular meaning. Even the location has a meaning. Revelation 1 verse 11. And I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and being turned I saw seven golden candlesticks. Where does he see Jesus? In which chamber does he see Jesus? He sees him in the holy place. So obviously we have a time setting. The ministry of the high priest is taking place in the holy place, not in the most holy, holy. So this is not Yom Kippur, the day of judgment. This is prior to the final judgment. 
So we are historically in a time before the close of probation, Jesus is ministering in the holy place. That's where he sees him. Because he sees him ministering amongst the seven candlesticks. Historically that's important. So if you look at the old postal route and you look at the various cities, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamon, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Laodicea, that's the old postal route and we're going to deal with that in the next lecture. So he has this great vision of ministering between seven golden candlesticks. And the candlestick stands for the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Revelation 1, 13, And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, Jesus the high priest, the ministering high priest, he's the one who is the light of the world. He is the one who is the bread from heaven, the bread of the presence. He is the one that mediates on your behalf. He is the altar of incense. And the incense rising up is the ministry of Christ in making our prayers acceptable through God, to God through his mediation. He is the one who deals and works in us to change our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. That's the picture that we have of a caring Jesus Christ who is in control, who knows exactly what's going to happen and foretells us in detail how he permits apostasy to take on the form that it is even in our time. Now, you know, this amazes me. If I were God, there would be a problem. Thank God. I'm not God. Because I wouldn't have the patience that he has to deal with apostasy the way he does. And how he permits it to grow and to reach fruit so that everyone can see it for what it is. By the way, if you look at the world out there today, is it a pleasant place? No, it's not a pleasant place. In some countries, I come from South Africa, our houses are like jails. Murders, left, right and centered. 4,000 farmers already murdered. Believe that or not. It's horrendous what's happening. And nobody even knows. If you take a country like Zimbabwe, they're just driving them off the lands. And there is no sanctity of anything anymore. We're living in really terrible times. It is not safe for a young girl, it is not safe for a young man these days to go jogging alone. What kind of world are we living in? And if you look at the horrendous things that are done in the world today, sometimes you wonder, how can God permit this? God is permitting sin and apostasy to ripen to the point where everybody will see what it means to choose against God's righteous ways and man's ways. And that is an act of love. And in the midst of the fear and the confusion, there's a quiet place where he calls and he says, Come unto me, you who are wearied and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So we can find peace in the midst of confusion. And we can choose. We can choose to walk through life and look at the thorns and the briars and the thistles. Or we could choose to look at the flowers and the lilies and the beautiful fruit. The choice is ours. And if we choose the one, we will choose sadness. If we choose the other one, in the midst of sadness, we can have peace. And that's what Jesus Christ is all about. He's the one in the midst of the candlesticks. He is the light of the world. But the candlesticks represents the churches that are to carry the light to the world throughout all the ages. 
And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to his foot, and girt about perhaps with a golden girdle. I'm quoting the King James, so sometimes it sounds a bit old-fashioned, but uh, at least we have all the words there. His hair... His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were as the flame of fire. Nothing escapes him. Perfect righteousness. His feet like unto fine brass, as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Revelation 1, 13 to 15. This was the voice of God. Jesus is described as God, not a created being. He was the one that was and that is and that is to come from all eternity, the one who initiated the process of creation, the one who spoke and it stood fast. That's how he is described here. The vision that we have of him here is the one that Daniel had, Ezekiel described him like this. He is seeing Yahweh. That's who he's seeing. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. It's the word of God. And his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. So there you have the true son of righteousness and the me feeble counterfeit is sun worship. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. And if you take one message home tonight, it's this one. In spite of what we're going to deal with in the lectures, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and I have the keys of hell and of death. He's the only one who can save you, and he has promised to do it. Write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things which shall be hereafter. Here's a key. How do we interpret what the book of Revelation is going to say? It deals with what you have seen, which is right now. So, which are? The prophet is looking at visions and they apply to that time. And the things which shall be hereafter. What's that? Future. Future. So how do we read the book of Revelation? Surely, if that is the key, then it applies to what happened then, throughout history, into the future. Yes or no? God is fair. Is he going to write a book and put it in his Bible and give it to every generation and say, here's a book, but it's not for you. Where, where, where? It's only for those who live in a couple of thousand years. Or is God going to put information for every generation in his book? Yes or no? God is just, he's fair. But we have whole groups today which take the book of Revelation and apply it only to the future. In fact, to a generation that will not even be here when it happens. In fact, to a whole church that will be gone and raptured when it is supposed to happen. Does that make any sense? No. The book of Revelation is historic continuous. What happened then is applicable to the people living then. What happened in the next generation is applicable to them. And we have the whole story all the way through to the end. It applies to us all. And particularly, of course, to the great culminating events in the history of time. The mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in my right hand, important, because on the right are the saved, on the left are the damned, and the seven golden stand candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels. Angel is a messenger of the seven churches, the seven churches of God in time periods, the preachers, if you like, those carrying the message. They are in the right hand of God. He's in control. In spite of what's happening, remember God is in control. And the seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. God has this amazing ministry that he uses fallen man to preach the word. Wow! He could have done it himself. 
He could have thundered it from heaven. He could have used angels, but he uses us. That's incredible. So the ministry of Christ in the heavenly sanctuary, if you look at the great story of how it all happened, when Christ rose from the dead, where did he go when he rose, to the, rose from the dead? He went up into heaven to serve in the sanctuary, says the uh, book of Hebrews, in a heavenly sanctuary. So we have a heavenly ministry. We won't be dealing with the details in this particular lecture. And it stretches from then to the end of time. And it's divided up in the sanctuary language where you have all the symbols like the candlesticks and the bread and the altar of incense in the first chamber and the second chamber. And then we know where we are in the stream of time so that we don't get lost in the book of Revelation. And he said unto me, Unto two thousand and three hundred days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Daniel 8 verse 14. So it goes right up to a particular time in history. We're not dealing with this prophecy either. There's a whole lecture on it, and you can find it in uh, one of the tapes. But just a little bit of background. In Daniel 8, we have this story of an unfolding of an amazing prophecy. So he came near where I stood, this angel, and when he came I was afraid and fell on my face, but he said unto me, Understand, O son of man, for that at the time of the end shall be the vision. Not the end of time, the time of the end. And while I was speaking in prayer, the man Gabriel, the angel, came to me in swift flight, and he said to me, O Daniel, I have now come to, out to give you wisdom and understanding. And then he proceeds to give a most amazing prophecy, which is a messianic prophecy. The most perfect prophecy that you can possibly imagine. It gives the time when the Messiah should come. So accurately that in the Talmud you read, may the bones of the hands and the bones of the fingers decay and decompose of him who turns the pages of the book of Daniel to find out the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27. This is written in the Talmud. And may his memory rot from off the face of the earth forever. Talmudic Law, page 978, section 2. Why would the Jewish Talmud contain such a curse for someone who tries to number the time of Daniel 9, 24 to 27? I'll tell you why. Because it tells you exactly when the Messiah will come. It tells you exactly what the Messiah will do. We're not dealing with this prophecy in detail. As I said, there is a whole video on it. You can get it if you want to. There's also a book written on it. So the fact of the matter is that only one Messiah in the history of mankind applies, and that's Jesus Christ. No one else. And if they were to accept Daniel 9, 24 to 27, what would have to happen with the Jewish religion? It would have to become the Christian religion. And it would disappear off the face of the earth. Something that they do not want. And so, rather curse the one who uses it. It tells us when a decree would go forth, it tells us when the Messiah would, would start his ministry. It tells us when the Messiah would die, 31 AD. And it tells us when the gospel would go to the Gentiles. A amazing prophecy. It's a 2,300 year prophecy dealing with this tremendous time period from the issuing of the decree to restore Jerusalem all the way until the time of judgment. And there's a date there, 1844, because the 2,300-day prophecy, if you add it all together, 2,300 years from there, in the Bible, it tells us in the book of Numbers that, and in the book of Ezekiel that you can take a day for a prophetic year. Then you get to an interesting date which we will deal with in another lecture. Far too complicated to deal with it now. And then there is a time which the Bible calls the time of the end. And we're living in that time right now. And then even one time we will come to the point of eternity. And the Bible teaches 
that Jesus is following the same ministry that was typified in that sanctuary service on earth. Hebrews 9.11 But Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not an earthly one, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, Hagion, having obtained eternal redemption for us. Very important point. That's what the King James says. Some modern translations don't like this, so they've changed this to most holy place big problem, because now the whole ministry of Christ shift. But that's a complicated story. We'll deal with it. It can't be a holy place. It has to be, can't be most holy place. must be a holy place, because if it were most holy, it wouldn't say Hagion, it would say Hagia Hagion, which it doesn't say. It says that, which actually means sanctuary. Hebrews 9 verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood. So this ministry could only start once Jesus had died. So Jesus must have entered the sanctuary to start his ministry only after his death, which means he entered into the first chamber and not into the second chamber, because the high priest only entered that once a year. And in the book of Revelation, where do we see Jesus serving in chapter 1? Where the candlesticks are. So why are they trying to twist the Bible here and there? Complicated thoughts. Just put them in the back of your mind. Don't worry about them. We don't have to understand everything first shot. We'll get to that later. Get clearer. Hebrews 9, verse 3, And after the second veil, the tabernacle which is called the holiest of all, Hagia Hagion, the high priest went once a year. That was a different story. And... Uh, when did Jesus do that? Obviously sometime after his resurrection. So the question I have to you tonight is if we have a high priest, and if that high priest is God, and if that high priest is the only one who through his blood can save you, then we have to choose him over all others. If there is no other name under heaven and earth whereby you may be saved, then we have to choose him over all others. But I have news for you. If you do, you will get into trouble sooner or later, either in the immediate circle or in the greater circle. But as for me and my house, I have decided to serve the Lord, and I would like to invite you to do the same. Thank you.
And now we're going to deal with the seven churches. We've already seen that we are supposed to read it in a historic, continuous way. Blessed is he that readeth, and that hear the word of the prophecy, and keep the things that are written therein, for the time is at hand. Revelation 1.3, the time is for each time in history, there was a time at hand. And of course, particularly for our time. I was in the Spirit in the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. And then we looked at the great Epinados in Revelation chapter 1, telling us that Jesus is the center of the whole book, the whole Bible, that He is the great I Am. We looked at how in the book of Genesis, man lost access to the tree of life, death came in, he had to earn his bread, lost dominion, became naked and was driven from God. And we looked in the first chapter on how there was a restoration to come in uh, access to the tree of life, victory over death, the hidden manna, Jesus, the one that would take away the spiritual hunger for all time, dominion was to be restored, white clothes, and no more separation from God. And we also saw in that first chapter, very briefly, that the seven churches represent the old postal route, starting with Ephesus, going to Smyrna, Pergamum, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Isn't it amazing that that is the sequence in which they occur, and how the postal route went, and it's also the sequence in which they are mentioned. God is truly amazing. Write the things which thou hast seen, then time application, the things which are, and the things which are hereafter, future application, the mystery of the seven stars which thou sawest in the right hand of the seven golden candlesticks, the seven stars are the angels, the messengers, if you like, of the seven churches. The seven candlesticks which thou sawest are the seven churches. So the church is the medium through which Christ disseminates the truth. So let's go to Turkey, Asia Minor, where we find these churches. This is the city of Istanbul. And here you'll find some of the most beautiful mosques in the world. You'll find remnants here of the great battle between the religions, the Ottoman Empire, great fort of the Ottomans, bridges over the Bosporus, marriages, people living there today like they live everywhere in the world. Everybody is seeking a place in the sun. Everybody is looking for someone to love. This is a young couple that is engaged. She's wearing pink here. And uh, there's the coach on top of one of the seven hills of Istanbul, Constantinople. It's one of the cities with seven hills. Rome is the other one with seven hills. It's interesting that both were capitals of the Roman Empire. And uh, here is the great blue mosque in Istanbul. Tremendous building representing one of the great religions of the world. And we'll be dealing with some of these issues as we go on in the book of Revelation. This is Saint Sophia, very interesting place. It's a museum today. It used to be in Byzantine times, it used to be a Christian church when the Muslims took over during the post Byzantine period. They changed it into a mosque and today it's a museum. It's interesting that in this church they had the Christian reliefs paint up, painted up against the walls and when the Muslims took over they whitewashed them. They just took whitewash and they painted over them. So they were gone to the site. And now over the ages the whitewash has faded. So when you walk into the church you actually see the Christian reliefs peeping through and you see which is something which to me is quite symbolic. It seems as if the great barriers between the religions are just coming down and uh, they're sort of blending into one. And interesting time 
uh, that the world is facing. This is the, the uh, underground channels where you can do your shopping. It's very dark down there. Of course, a very interesting country, Turkey, one of the great countries to visit. Excellent uh, facilities, beautiful food, third world, first world, all in one. The great city of Troy was then, and so it's the remnant of that city. And uh, this is what's left of the town of Troas. This is where Paul preached one night, and he must have been uh, uh, a tedious preacher who kept on for hours and hours, such as myself, because poor old Eutychus couldn't take it anymore, fell asleep like they sometimes do in mine too, and crashed down from the window and broke his neck, and the miracle took place where Paul prayed over him, and he was healed. This was the place. Today it's just a little harbour place where fishermen sort of launch their boats. And uh, this is where we have the setting of the seven churches in this area. So each of the seven churches where Christ is represented as disseminating his light to the world, each of these names have a particular meaning. And they have a prophetic meaning. There's a certain character in each of these churches that is described, which applies to them at that time and has a future application into the future. Then the churches get a commendation, something that they are doing right. And uh, it's interesting that there is a church that does not have a commendation, but we'll come to that later. Then there is reproof, and reproof is very important because it tells us something about the time period again. If you are being reproved and asked to repent, is probation then over, yes or no? Obviously not. Because if you can still repent after reproof, well then probation cannot be over. And so you cannot take this prophecy and throw it into the future after the close of probation. That would do violence, not only to the terminology, but would do violence to the structure where it occurs. It is set by the chiasma into the historic arm. Christ is ministering in the holy place, not in the most holy. So this is a time period of his ministry which does not pertain to the time of the end, although the prophecy proceeds throughout the entire Christian time, even into that time. So there's a reproof, there's a counsel, and then there is a promise. That's the basic structure of all the letters to the churches. Now the first one is the town of Ephesus. It was a very prosperous town today. These are the ruins of Ephesus. Here is the great street of Curet. This is where Paul must have walked when he ministered in this particular town. And the name Ephesus means desirable. So it's a desirable condition to be in. This church has something going for it. And if it is the first in a period, because remember it says what is, and what is to come, historic, continuous, until the end of time, because that's how God works. He has concern for every generation. Then it must be the first period of Christianity, and uh, if we study the events, we can put an arbitrary time on it, probably to about A.D. 100. And we can learn something about the what is, what it was like then as it applies to the church in history as well. Well, in Ephesus there was the seat of Diana. And Diana was the mother of the gods. This is where Paul had his great argument about this very issue because he said Jesus is the only way and then there was this big tumults because they said no no he's putting down Diana our goddess and uh, they wanted to take him to task. So she was the mother of the gods. There was a temple of Diana which was built in 480 BC. It's interesting that uh, the Christian council, the council of Ephesus was held in this very town, Ephesus, and there the title Mother of God was given to Mary. 
So there's some interesting little correlations over there with the seat of the mother of the gods and here a title was given to Mary in this town as well. So that's the setting of this church. Let's read the letter to the church. Revelation chapter 2 verse 1 to 3. Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things says he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. We've dealt with this text already. I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. That's the commendation. So Jesus is saying to them, I can see what you're doing, I am happy with what you are doing, and you have discernment between good and evil. And thou hast tried them which say they are apostles. So even in this early period, there were some who were trying to lead astray, yes or no? But they tried them. And what was the standard whereby they discerned whether they were from the good side or the bad side? Must be the word of God. That's the standard how they, you tried them, and which say that they are apostles and are not, so they were deceivers and liars then in the early church, and we will see that in the lectures that come. And has found them liars. How do you find them liars? What standard do you use to find them liars? Your feeling? Or must you have something to base it on? Surely you must have something to base it on. The Word of God and has borne and has patience, and for my name's sake has labored and has not fainted. That's a good commendation for the church at Ephesus. They still had their act together. But there's a reproof. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. So that first fire that the church had, that fire which you feel when you become converted and you go off and you run to bring the message, they had cooled down somewhat. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, turn around, and do the first works. So complacency had set in to an extent, but they knew right from wrong, that was good. They worked and labored for God, that was good. But that firstborn zeal, that was slightly tainted. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place. So here was a time period that if a church did not live up to whatever truth they had, then God would do what? Take that candlestick away from them and give it to someone else. Very important point. So in this time period, we're still dealing in a time in history that if you don't live up to the light that you have, God will eventually take the light and give it to someone else to carry. But this thou hast, that thou hatest. That's strange. God hates something. And he commends them for hating something here. Hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Huh. Remember now, this is a very important point. God hates the deeds. Does he hate the people? No. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. God loves people, but he hates false systems of worship. So the early church had the discernment to hate the Nicolaitans. Who were the Nicolaitans? What were they? Nicolas, Nicolaitan. They were a group that taught, they were a sect, a Gnostic sect, that taught that the law of God did not apply to man in the flesh because man was spirit and flesh, and therefore what he did in the flesh did not apply to his spirituality. It's a very common thought today as well. So what the Nicolaitans taught then, they teach today. Nicolas was Poseidon worship. It was the god of the sea, the Nicolaitan. Nic 